The 130th Psalm reads this way, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him a plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We sure do thank you for the good testimonies. We thank you for the good singing. Lord, our hearts have been blessed to be here tonight. Lord, we thank you for the goodness and, and the glory of our Lord. The Lord, it's been said several times, Lord, we're undeserving of your marvelous grace, but we are grateful for it. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd help us from the Scriptures. I pray you'd enlighten our minds, and Lord, you'd challenge our hearts. And Lord, I pray the Word of God would burn in our hearts, and Lord, it would transform us into thy likeness. And God, I pray that folks would see the goodness of God in our lives, and they too would come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Now, Father, bless. Lord, speak to hearts, and God... If there's anybody amongst us that's lost, I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. God, if there's anybody here tonight who's really needing help from God, I pray that tonight they'd find that help they need. I do pray, Father, for those working with the teens over on the other side. God, you'd bless their efforts. And God, I pray for those young people. Thank you for them. Lord, uh, I'm glad we got young people that still love coming to church. God, I pray for them. I pray that, God, you would put a hedge about them. You'd protect them. Lord, we know the devil's got a bullseye on their back, and he wants to destroy their lives. Uh, but, Lord, I'm reminded you said in the Scriptures, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And so, God, I pray you'd help them. I pray that the lesson they get back there tonight would be exactly what they need to propel them uh, uh, above the wiles of the devil even this very week while they're... Uh, living their lives. Now, Father, bless and get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it. Use this unworthy vessel, and we'll thank you for that as well, for it's in Jesus' holy, wonderful, and glorious name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, I want to break down this psalm, and I want you to notice that in these verses, we can draw from the fact that the psalmist is hurting. Look again at verse number 1. He said, Out of the depths... Have I cried unto thee, O Lord? He's crying from the depths of his heart. Verse 2, he says, Lord, hear my voice. Let mine ears be attentive to the voice uh, uh, of my supplications. He's hurting. He, he's in a low spot in his life. Uh, and dear friend, I don't know if you've ever been there. Uh, there you're subject to any day finding yourself uh, hurting. Uh, you may face uh, family problems. You may face financial problems. Uh, you may face uh, a, a society-type problems. You may face problems on the job. Uh, 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 friend, you can have all of that going well, uh, but still face internal problems uh, that will cause you to hurt, uh, cause you to seek after God, uh, cause you to long for God to move into the midst of your hurt. Uh, Listen, there's sometimes you hurt so much that only God can soothe your pain. Well, the psalmist is hurting. Now, we don't really know who wrote this psalm. It's widely believed that it was David, and it's widely believed that when he was on the run from Saul and he's living in caves, we're talking he's no longer in the palace, he no longer has the nation uh, crying at, that he's the champion of Israel. Uh, uh, now he's hurting. Uh, he's wondering if life will ever uh, be good again. He's wondering if the sun will ever shine again. And friend, there are days when you're subject to wonder, uh, is the goodness of God ever going to come my way again? We see the psalmist is hurting, 
But then we find the psalmist is honest. And let me just say this. You're never going to get help from the Lord until you get honest with the Lord. Mm. Uh, uh, now I know, I know being Baptist, we walk in and we act like uh, because we're saved and we're eternally saved and our name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we walk in like we have no problems. And we smile, the Baptist smile, whatever that is. And we got the Baptist handshake, whatever that is. And we act like there's nothing going on in our lives but all pie sky and it's all rainbows and unicorns and everything's wonderful. Uh, and that's why a lot of people don't get help. Um, because they're trying to put on a front, and they even do it with God, Brother Ron. Do you know he knows the intents and thoughts of your heart and of your mind? He knows all about you. He knows your down-sitting, your uprising. He knows your yesterdays. He knows your tomorrows. And you're not going to get any help from God until you get honest with God. God resisted the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Now look at the psalmist in verse 3. He said, If thou, Lord, shouldest, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Now think about that. If God was to record our iniquities, who could stand before God and ask anything? Now I know uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of preachers want to lump sin and iniquity in the same bag. Can I say they're not the same thing? Uh, I believe God knows the difference between sin and iniquity. If they're the same thing, he'd have called it either sin or iniquity. And sin is when we uh, disobey the commands or the laws of God. The Bible says, for him to know to do good, doeth it not, to him it is sin. But iniquity is when we have unequal dealings with God. And my dear friends, that just simply means when the world, or when somebody gets more of our attention than God does, we have iniquity in our lives. Mm -hmm. It would absolutely dumbfound us if we found out the real reason why a lot of people don't come to church, why a lot of people don't read their Bible, why a lot of people don't pray, why a lot of people... It's because of iniquity. Mm -hmm. It's awful hard to talk to God when uh, you put everything before Him. And so... Get away from the thought of sin. Just think about how much more attention we've given the world over stupid stuff than we've given God over serious stuff. How much have we talked on the phone to somebody talking about a, the best sale in town, and how little have we talked to sinners about being saved by the good grace of God? Mm -hmm. And see, if God was to mark our iniquities... There's none of us could stand before God. Hmm? Uh, if he was to hold those in contempt of us, hmm? we well, got real quiet there. Uh, but he's, he's just being honest. Uh, look at verse number four. The most wonderful word in the Bible, that little conjunction, but. Uh, you know, if God's to mark our iniquities, who could stand? But, hallelujah, hmm. but there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. And what honesty. Lord, uh, I know in myself I find it no good thing. Lord, I know I fail you. I fail your grace. And uh, Lord, I haven't been what I should be. Uh, and Lord, if you held it against me, I couldn't stand uh, but praise the Lord, there is forgiveness with the Lord. Uh, what a blessing to know that truth. Uh, and see, the devil will hold that over you. He'll say, uh, you're not worth the powder to take the blow away. And uh, you're not worthy of being saved. And you're not worthy of this. And you know what? He's right. Uh, but praise be unto God, there is forgiveness with the Lord. Uh, I'm not standing here in my own righteousness. Uh, I'm robed in the righteousness of Christ. Uh, and when he sees me, he don't see my faults and failures. Uh, he sees the blood of his dear son, uh, and he says, justified. Uh, he says, forgiven. Uh, he says, redeemed. Uh, and I say, bless the Lord. Uh, and why does God forgive us? So that others may see and fear and come to trust in him as well. This is a great secret the devil doesn't want you to find out. 
As long as you're walking around on your lower lip, I'm not worthy to be saved. As long as you act like Eeyore, thanks for noticing. Nobody wants what you got. Uh, I watch most people come in on Sunday morning and I don't want what they got. And they're in church. But if you realize you're not worthy, but because of what He's done in your life, He's made you worthy, you can walk with your head up uh, and you can say, Not I, but the grace of God. Uh, uh, not I, but Christ that liveth in me. Uh, uh, you can walk and say, I know I'm not worthy. Uh, he is worthy. He's the one that redeemed me and saved me. Uh, and all of a sudden, people get to look at you and say, Hey, I want what that guy's got. Mm. He's being honest. He's hurting, but he's honest. But then notice, if you will, the psalmist is holding. Look what it says, verse number 5. I wait for the Lord. Boy, that's a hard phrase. When you're hurting and you've been honest before God, you're hoping that God will just give you a word. You're hoping God will send peace. You're hoping God will straighten out your situation. God hadn't spoken yet. He said, I wait for the Lord. He said, my soul doth wait. And in His word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Boy, I heard Caleb Lindsay preach morning from morning to morning. Remember that, Brother Phil? I never heard a message like that. Out of that verse right there. And y'all ought to go down there when he's down there at Lawrence. I'm going to pray God lets him preach it again. I'd sit there and listen to it again. What a message from morning to morning. But here he's hoping and he's waiting for something from God. He's holding back until he hears from God. Now, now let me help everybody. We live in a society that wants instant gratification. And there are folks that will pray, and they say, okay, I've talked to God, and you'll run with your first emotion, your first feeling, your first thought. That's a dangerous thing. You better wait till God speaks. And He's holding back. He's not going to do anything until God makes known the will of God. And it's a hard thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. Don't act on emotion. Don't act on feeling. Don't act on advice. Wait for God, and then do what God says. He's hurting. He's honest. He's holding. And then he becomes hopeful. Hmm? Now, verse 5, he said, In his word do I hope. And can I say, that's where our hope lies. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But look at verse 7. He said, Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. He's hoping for the goodness and grace of God to show up. Notice when he's honest, the very thing that he deals with is our iniquities. And we can't stand before God with our iniquities over us. But he ends with the hope that God's going to redeem Israel from all his iniquities. What hope? Hmm? You know why we don't have revival? There's no hope for revival. We've listened to everybody say for years that we can't have revival because things are so bad. Mm, are you saying God's limited? Mm, the Bible says there's nothing impossible with God. The only one that's staying revival is not God, it's us and our lack of hope and our lack of faith. But if we hope for God to redeem America, and by the way, it'll take a work of Almighty God to change America. America's a mess. America's divided. 
America's got the, the you know, we're, we're chasing the tail instead of the tail chasing the head. I mean, this thing's a mess. We, we got a guy sitting in the White House, don't even know where he's at. Huh? Uh, I mean, it is an absolute mess. This country's a mess. I was thinking the other day, if you put your, your finger on the pulse of the worst problem in America, Lord have mercy, start flipping coins. Hmm? The worst problem in America is America turned her back on God. And we need God back in America. And God's not going to come to the White House. He's going to come to the church house. We get enough God in our churches, we'll see a difference in America. Um, but I'm telling you, this country's a mess. We, we're in bad shape. And, and said something on America. How come all these places that call themselves sanctuary cities don't like it when, when people are busting all these illegal aliens to their cities? It's all right if they move to Barry, Kentucky, where you're at. But they don't want them in Chicago. I thought they were Sanctuary City. And poor Martha's Vineyard. I say, Ron DeSantos, he's got my boat. Now, I was in Jacksonville. Y'all met Brother Greg Neal, my friend. He was up here last year. I was in his church. He said, leave his governor alone. They like him right where he's at. Florida don't want to give up, old Ron. But uh, uh, listen, uh, it's, it's, uh, how come all them multi-millionaires that are quick to tell us we need to buy electric vehicles and quick to tell us how we ought to spend our money and quick to tell us uh, 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 that we're to put up with all this stuff, uh, but when it hits their town, they didn't like it. Hmm? Uh, can I say they, they, had them, they had them immigrants out there quicker than you can, you can blink your nose or blink your eyes and flip your nose or whatever, huh? Mm, it's bad. And you know where they put them? They put them on a military base in a concentration camp. How come AOC ain't out there crying over them? Mm, yeah, yeah. I did read one caption. It said to gather them all up, all the illegal aliens but one who had a faith bir fake birth certificate from Hawaii. Y'all figure that out. That's right. Buddy Barack. Somebody got it. All right. Got to help some of them out. Huh? But America's in a mess. But my dear friends, if all we do is sit and complain about it and we don't talk to God about it, and we don't get all the God we can get in our lives, how can we expect them to get... They don't know God. Uh, uh, listen, here in Kentucky, Mitch McConnell, he don't know God. Uh, our governor don't know God. We did have a governor that knew God, and uh, Sister Dawn's uh, favorite union voted him out. What are you laughing at? You belong to the same union. Teacher, teacher. Huh? It's the best. Well, I'm here to tell you, the only hope is God. And He's just not going to show up in spite of folks. The Bible says, Seek and you shall find. It still says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven forgive their sin, and heal their land. Amen. He's just waiting for some folks to seek his face. Hmm? But I'm not going to preach on that. I'm interested in verse number 7. And for you folks from Wisconsin, I'm sorry I got off on politics. It's just my nature, you know. I'm just sorry. You know, just one of them deals. Uh, thank God for folks from Wisconsin. Amen. Uh, but I'm interested in verse number 7. Again, I've read this verse, I don't know how many times I've heard messages preached. I've preached out this uh, uh, text before. But verse number 7, I got to read this. Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. Now, as I begin to look at that, Brother Ron... Israel can have hope because in the Lord there's mercy and with Him is plenteous redemption. Can I say they can have hope because Lord, the Lord is the fund 
of mercy and he's the fountain of redemption. And when you're trusting in the Lord, you'll find everything you need. And there's hope because we have the Lord. But I'm interested in that phrase, and with him is plenteous redemption. I want to preach with God's help on that thought, plenteous redemption. Now, could I say that if you read most commentators and you, you, you read after folks, they'll deal with plenteous redemption in this way, and it is true that his redemption is plenteous because you will find it for everyone, everywhere. Jesus tasted death for every man. It's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, it don't matter where you come from. Don't matter what color you are. God's no respecter of persons. Uh, don't matter uh, uh, what side of the tracks you're from. Don't matter uh, how uh, much or how little change you got in your pocket. Uh, uh, doesn't matter how far off the depths and sin you've went. Uh, don't matter how big the pit you're in. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, there's mercy and redemption in the Lord. Uh, uh, Jesus will save you. Uh, uh, the Bible said, For God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, that word whosoever means whosoever. Uh, 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 what a blessing. There is plenteous redemption uh, that everyone that's ever breathed God's air has had the opportunity to get saved by the good grace of God. Many have chosen to reject His salvation and unfortunately because of the choices of some tyrants or the laziness of Christians. There's a lot of folks that have never heard the gospel. Mm -mm. There are certain parts of the world when the gospel was presented, the tyrants wouldn't let it be preached there. And there's other parts of the world where it could be preached and Christians have gotten too busy living life that they've forgotten why God saved us, is to go and preach the gospel to every creature to go to our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other most parts of the world, letting folks know Jesus saves. Well, I got under conviction today. I, I got home, I checked my phone after service, and most of you know I, I reach out to about 200 preachers every Sunday morning, send them a little, little thought of encouragement. Some of you get that little thought of encouragement. Uh, and I got home, and Brother Rom, and you know, all know he was just here not long ago from Guyana. He's back home now, Brother Rom. He sent me a little voicemail with some pictures. It's a picture of a fella. And uh, uh, he said, hello, my dear pastor friend. You know how Brother Ron talks. Uh, and, and he said, uh, this man, I, I helped uh, the Lord use me to train him in the ministry. He has taken one of the works over. Uh, and he said, pastor, this man would walk to church three and a half miles every time he went to church. He said, but because of my trip to America, I was able to buy him a bicycle. And he's sitting there showing him with this red bicycle. And I'm thinking, here, we've got to get up and choose what we're going to drive to church. Mm. Uh, oh, we've never suffered for Jesus. We've been so blessed. God's been so good to us. And yet, that little fellow is walking to church. He has no problem going out and telling folks they need Jesus. And God's blessed us so good that we don't think anybody needs to know about Him. Mm. God help us. But plenteous redemption means God can save everybody everywhere. Mm. But if that's all it was, it wouldn't give much hope for those that are saved. And so I got to really praying and studying about that. It not only means that it's for sinners everywhere. And it's for all sinners everywhere. But it also has a connotation for the saved. It is for every need in every situation. Mm, thank God He's got grace for us for every need in every situation. And we're recipients of the grace of God because of the plenteous redemption of God. 
And because uh, he not only redeemed me, uh, but he put me in the family of God, uh, his redemption uh, is new and his mercies are new every day. Uh, and I am still drawing from the goodness of the redemption of God uh, that I became a partaker of uh, some 48 years ago. Uh, see, if it only dealt with saving my soul, uh, it had just been redemption. Uh, but it's a plenteous redemption. Uh, hey, it works in my life every day of my life. Uh, I'm glad I can't uh, uh, save myself. Uh, I can't keep myself saved. Uh, but I'm saved by the power of God uh, and the work of the plenteous redemption He's done in my life. Uh, so I got to thinking about this plenteous redemption, and the Lord has plenteous redemption. Even after we're saved... He has redemption for us for our sins. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 2, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Now get a hold of this. When God saved you, He saved you from your sin. Now if it was just redemption, He could have only saved you from the sin that you had committed up to that point in your life. But you see, a plenteous redemption saved me from my past sins, my present sins, uh, and even my future sin. All my sin has been forgiven uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, the handwritings of ordinances that was against me uh, was nailed to his cross and taken out of the way. Uh, but even uh, uh, when I fail the grace of God uh, in my life each and every day, uh, his plenteous redemption uh, already has it forgiven. I say hallelujah. Now it's kind of like this. You go to 8731 Heritage Drive down the road here, and you go in my house, the electricity is on. But you don't know that till you activate it by flipping the switch. You've already got forgiveness of your sin. If you've got sin, unconfessed sin in your life, you need to activate the forgiveness by calling on the Lord and asking Him to forgive you of your sin besetting sin the Bible says in 1 John 1 9 that if we'll confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins uh, why uh, because that's how good a God he is he has a plenteous redemption and I bless his name by the way any unconfessed sin does not have any impact on your relationship if you're in the family of God you're in the family of God but it does have an impact on your fellowship. Yes, That's why you need to constantly confess your sins. The Apostle Paul said he died daily. Right. Every day we need to die out to sin uh, because I don't want anything to come in between me and God. I want our fellowship to be good. Right. Listen, uh, 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 it's not a good thing at the foster household when any of us tick off mama. And I certainly want fellowship with mama to be good. So if I mess up, which is a ongoing thing, uh, you don't know. You're not married. Did you get the house cleaned up before she come home? Yeah. Yeah. So I said, Brother Jim rushed out. I said he's got to go clean up the house. That's what it is. Miss Judy's coming home, huh? But if you're not careful, you allow things uh, to affect your fellowship, Brother Brian. I imagine married to that lumpy Indian that you're married to, that if you make her mad. It's not good at your house. Mm. Uh, and I imagine it's not only not good for the day, I imagine it lasts. Mm. We was watching Family Feud the other night said, when you, ma when you make your wife mad, how long does she stay mad? People going, an hour? I'm thinking, an hour? That'd be a blessing. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, week, two weeks, huh? Hey, one of the doctors she worked for made her mad. She didn't talk to him for three months. He finally called a truce. He said, it's over. It's over. I'm sorry. I won't make you mad anymore. Huh? There's something about making them mad. You ain't been married long enough. You want that fellowship to be good. You don't care if anybody else in the household is mad at you, but you want mama to be right. You know what I'm saying? You want that to be good. Huh? And, hey, fellas, 
you got to learn these words. Hey, you can get one. You got to learn these. Yes, dear, and I'm sorry. The greatest words. And, what are you laughing at? I'm telling the truth, son. Huh? Write that down in your notes. Yes, dear, and I'm sorry. Write it down. Y e s d e a r. Yes, dear, and I'm sorry. Boys, like I ain't never get married. Huh? We don't want to have a fellowship problem with the Lord. Huh? Listen, it's a terrible thing if somebody calls you and asks you to pray for them, and you've got to get right with God before you can pray for them. Mm. Huh? Listen, He has plenty of redemption. He has redemption for our sin. he chose to come and dwell in us I don't know but listen on our best days we're still apt to come short and could I say even in our shortcomings in his plenteous redemption he's made provision for us the Bible says he was touched with the feeling of our infirmities yet he was without sin he knows what it is to have a body of clay. He knows what it is to be tempted. He knows what it is to hurt. He knows what it is to be hurt. He knows all those things so he understands. Uh, he doesn't condone our shortcomings, uh, but in his plenteous redemption, uh, he made provision for our shortcomings uh, that it won't interrupt our relationship with him. Thank God for plenteous redemption. Is this making any sense? Can I say, His redemption is not only for our sins and our shortcomings, but also our shallowness. Hmm. There are some times in the Scriptures when the Lord was dealing with His disciples and He was using a parable, and He would give it to them and they'd say, Oh, yeah, yeah. And they didn't get it. And then He would expound on it. And they wouldn't get it. And then they'd fail the grace of God and he'd remind them what they taught, what he taught them when they were shallow and didn't get it. But now they understood it. Prime example. He told Peter. He said, Peter, Satan hath desired thee that he may sift thee with wheat, uh, uh, sift thee like wheat. Uh, he said, but when thou art converted, uh, strengthen the brethren. And Peter said, there boosts his chest. I won't fail you, Lord. I'm going to go with you all the way to the death. But then when Peter fell, he was reminded what Jesus told him. You see, sometimes we're so shallow. We think that, well, we can handle it. And God tries to warn us. He'll give the preacher a message or the Sunday school teacher a message or you'll be reading your daily devotion or uh, you'll be just reading the Word of God and God will show you something. Uh, and you think, oh, yeah, I got that back when I was uh, 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 first saved. Yeah, I can handle it. Yeah, God, I can handle it. And then all of a sudden, you get the legs knocked out from underneath you. But yet the Lord reminds us how shallow he was. But then he reminds us that he still loves us. Because he has a plenteous redemption. Even for our shallowness. I thought about this. He's got plenteous redemption for our straying. And when I talk about strain, there are people that Luke 15 stray. They leave the Father's house, go to a far country, and they blow their testimony. But I'm not talking about that kind of strain. And he does have provision for that strain. I'm talking about driving down the road and squirrel. You can be sitting in the house of God and all of a sudden your mind takes you somewhere else. No. But his plenteous redemption even works in our life when our mind's somewhere else. We're apt to stray. Huh? We're apt to get our mind on something other than him. We're apt to get our eyes on something other than him. We're apt to get our attention and our focus, uh, uh, even our desires on something other than Him. Uh, but I'm glad for the sweet Holy Ghost of God uh, uh, that tugs at our hearts and brings us back into focus. Uh, and I'm glad for the plenteous redemption that, oh, my dear friends, restores us back to Him. Amen. Uh, you see, 
I said the other night, there's, there's a whole crowd out there. Miss Janet testified the other night about being a Methodist, and for 40 years she didn't have the hope of eternal security because they didn't teach that because they don't believe it. But thanks be unto God, she met Dwight Kaufman, Baptist preacher, showed her the scriptures, and she got it down that, hallelujah, we're saved and secure for eternity. That I'm in the Father's hand, and his hand, or I'm in his hand, his hand's in the Father's hand, no man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. What a blessing, huh? And, and I thank the Lord for that, that we have that eternal security. But you know the, the Church of God crowd and the Pentecostal crowd and the crowd that believes you can lose it, there's a real problem with their doctrine. They'll take a couple of obscure verses out of context and try and build their doctrine. But the truth of the matter is, I've never had one that believed that doctrine could show me what sin it is that causes you to lose your salvation. Huh? They, they can't do it. Because no matter what, their sin never takes them that far. Hmm? But they'll say, but you know, you can't, you can't you know, do this and be saved. Uh, that could be so. But if you're saved, you can't lose it. Because it's not yours to lose. It's His salvation. My salvation isn't in the baptismal pool. My salvation isn't in what I prayed. My salvation isn't in anything I've done. My salvation's in Jesus Christ, and I believe the Word of God. Uh, and I just did what God said. But listen, the argument is, if you could lose your salvation, then Jesus would have had to die on the cross the second time to be able to forgive you the second time and redeem you the second time. Now hang with me. If we didn't have plenteous redemption, if we failed the grace of God and we came short of the glory of God and strayed from God, our redemption would only be good for the initial salvation. We'd had to have Him die on the cross the second time to restore us to the faith. But because He has plenteous redemption, He died once for all. Are you listening? Uh, and he has the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and he's alive forevermore. And you have to understand in the Old Testament economy, uh, uh, those that sought asylum in a city of refuge, uh, they had refuge as long as the high priest was alive. Uh, and after the high priest passed away, uh, uh, then the avenger could come in and take them and take their life. Uh, hey, we've got uh, refuge uh, in the Lord Jesus, our heavenly high priest, uh, as long as he's alive. Uh, and he's alive forevermore. Hallelujah. And I'm never, ever had to worry about let the avenger get a hold of me. Huh? The avenger lost me the day I got saved. Mm. But even in my strain, there's plenty of redemption. Can I say this? In our slothfulness, there's plenty of redemption. Mm. The greatest indictment of the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3 is they were increased with goods and thought they had need of nothing. And Jesus said, you don't know that you're poor, blind, wretched, naked. And can I say, that's, that's a great commentary of the modern day church and Christian. We've been blessed so good and increased with, with so much. Uh, we've not faced adversity in so long. We think we've arrived. We don't realize how poor spiritually we really are. But even in our slothfulness, God winks at our ignorance because of his plenteous redemption. Can I say this? Even in our suspicions. You say, what does that mean? Our distrust. When we doubt God. Hmm? Now it's very hard to think that if God's so big that he can save us and indwell us and change our lives, certainly we'll never doubt that. Yet, you go on down the road for a little while, you quit praying and quit seeking Him like you should, and you'll start doubting some things of God too. Hmm? I used to really get upset. I was back in high school and studying Old Testament survey years and years and years and years. You weren't even born years ago. And 
I'd read about them Jews. They'd get down there to the Red Sea. God would part the Red Sea. They'd go across the Red Sea. God would swallow up the Red Sea and, and drown all Pharaoh's army. And it wasn't three days down the road. They're murmuring, complaining against God and doubting God. Uh, and it seemed like uh, 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 throughout the Old Testament, God would be good to Israel. And it wasn't long. Uh, and they're serving false gods. And they're doubting God. And boy, I'd get so bad, I'd say, you sorry, no good Jews. Uh, look what God done for you. And you're doubting Him not only for the Holy Ghost to remind me Number one, they didn't have a Bible. Number two, the Holy Ghost didn't indwell them. And number three, the Holy Ghost been awful good to me, and how many times have I doubted God? Mm. Uh, but even in our suspicions, our distrust, mm, in plenteous redemption, my standing with God is good. It's hard to believe. What a God. What grace God has. Why, well, I like that, that song. Help me out the name of it. How can I ever doubt a God whose hands hold the universe? Huh? Oh, it's, he's been so good. What, what is it? He's, what is it? He'll be enough for me. Hmm? Huh? Well, I love that song. Why? Because it just reminds us, even in my weakness and my frailty, God's strength and almightiness takes over. What a blessing. I got one more point. Some of you are about to pass out. In this plenty's redemption, the Lord has redemption for our selfishness. You know, that's the very essence of sin. My right to my claim to myself. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches we've been bought with a price that our life is no longer our own. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And any time I seek to do my will and not His will, I'm selfish. Hmm. Well, there have been times I've been sitting in a meeting. And I go to take up an offering. And I'm fumbling through there looking for a five. And the Holy Ghost say, you got a 50 in there. Huh? Now, I've learned now, but early on, I'd say, but Lord, that's $50. And he'd say, well, what do you think it costs me to go up Calvary? Then you give the 50 and you got to repent while you're doing it. You know what I'm saying? I've learned. I just open it up and say, what, what do you want, Lord? <laughs> oh, because there's usually not that much in there anyway. But I just open it up. So, uh, we get so selfish when God's been so unselfish in our lives. Uh, you know, every now and then I, I watch as people pull in. I look at the cars people drive in on. I know some of the addresses that some of us live at. I know some of the jobs that God's blessed some of us to have. I look at the offerings that God gives us in our little church. I look at all the missionaries we support out of this little church, and I think, boy, God's been good to us. Huh? Who are we? Huh? Just a little church on a hill. Now, hallelujah, there's enough of us hadn't got over being saved yet. We try our best to mind Him, but there's still days we don't. But His plenteous redemption just still works on our behalf. It's kind of like this. I know there's that pharisaical crowd. They paint God out to have a big chastening rod just waiting for us to step out of line so He can whack us. If that was the case, there'd be none of us here. We'd already been whacked. We'd been the mole whacked at the carnival. We'd been whacked out of our brains if that was the case. Well, it's kind of like this. A little Johnny or little Susie is out of line, and Dad wants to light them up. But Mama says, but he or she's had a bad day. Why don't you let me talk to them? Why, why, why don't we try this? Uh, how many times would the wrath of God not be satisfied with anything less than the chastening rod? But that sweet Holy Ghost of God 
intercedes on our behalf to Jesus and he takes it as our mediator to the Father and says, but Father, that's one of ours. And Lord, we'd be justified. But Lord, let's give him another chance. Let's speak to him in this area. Let's let plenteous redemption do its work. And Oh, what a God. What an intercessor we have. What a Savior we have. What a plenteous redemption He has that not only saved us, but continually works in our life because we don't have enough sense to be what we should be. Oh, what a Savior. So I've said all that tonight to remind you how gracious merciful he really is never lose sight of the fact that we definitely are faring much better than we deserve and never take for granted the work of the plenteous redemption of Christ on behalf of us maybe it's been a while since you thanked him for it maybe you haven't been what you should be Maybe you need to come and tell him, Lord, if you marked iniquities, who could stand? Maybe tonight you're not saved and God's been speaking your heart about it. Tonight be a good night to get saved where you could experience the plenteous redemption of Almighty God. Listen, friend, when we get to, get, when we get to heaven, we're not going on our merit. We're all going to stand and say, we made it by grace and the plenteous redemption of Almighty God. Tonight, why don't you let him know how thankful you really are for the work he's done in your life. Let's all stand. Brother Ray, if you come, get a song of invitation. Folks are coming, and while they're getting a song, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, thank you for what you showed me of that verse. Thank you for your marvelous unadulterated grace thank you for your tender mercy thank you for being long suffering thank you Lord for your plenteous redemption now Father somebody here tonight might need some help I pray you'd go by their way Lord somebody might be hurting like that psalmist go by their way Somebody might have been hoping for a long time and holding back, waiting on you. I pray you'd go by their way. God, there may be somebody here tonight lost. I pray, God, you'd convict them, but then show them the tender mercy of God. Lord, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. So, God, I pray they'd come and let you do a work in their lives. Save their never-dying soul. God, whatever the need is, I pray folks would do business with God. Have your will and way now. Again, speak to hearts. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.